Hi, this is lecture two in a six part series um, on the foundations of deep reinforcement learning. Lecture two fits right here within all the others. In lecture one, we covered the foundations of MDPs and exact solution methods. We're gonna build on that now to uh, try to understand deep Q learning. So quick one slide recap of what we did in lecture one. Um, we looked at optimal planning or control, which is given an MDP, which consists of a set of states, actions, a often probabilistic transition model, a reward function, a discount factor gamma, and a horizon capital H, find the optimal policy pi star. We saw some exact methods to do this. We saw value iteration, we saw policy iteration. There are exact solution methods. So in some sense, you could think, aren't we done? But we're not. And the reason we're not done is because they have some limitations. First of all, they require access to the dynamics model or transition model. Indeed, in the update equations, it has right there the probability of next state given current state in action. You need to have access to that to run those equations. That's not often the case that when an agent has to learn to do something in a new environment that it already has access to exactly how that world works. And so we'll look at how to address that through sampling based approximations where the agent collects their own experience and based on these sampled experiences still is able to learn how to do well in these environments and then the second thing that was uh, a limitation of the exact approaches is that they had a loop a loop that loops over all states and actions and for any kind of reasonably interesting um, situation the number of states and often also actions will be really, really large. It'll be impractical to have a loop that looks at all of them. And so we'll look at Q function and value function fitting, and in fact, also policy fitting uh, in, in later lectures to address that, where instead of having a table with the value or action for each state, because we cannot have such a table, there's too many states, we'll have a function often in the form of a neural network that can take in a state and output the corresponding value or action that you might want to take. Okay, so that's effectively what the remainder, including this, the remainder five lectures will be about is how to go to sampling based approximations and how to use function fitting rather than tabular approaches to solve MDPs. All right, so for this lecture, the focus will be on a specific type of algorithms called Q learning. We'll first look at Q-learning in still the tabular simpler setting to build intuition and introduce these sampling-based aspects. And then to introduce the function fitting aspects, we'll do a quick refresher on neural networks slash deep learning, and then we'll use them inside Q-learning, which we'll call deep Q networks. And which is actually um, the approach, and we'll specifically look at that approach that was used by DeepMind for the 2013 breakthrough reinforcement learning for Atari games. So quick recap from the previous lecture. What are Q values? Q star SA is the expected utility, is the expected sum of discounted rewards that the agent will accumulate when starting in state S, committing to action A in that state S at this time, and there onwards acting optimally. We had a Bellman equation to find those Q values. So Q star SA, we can decompose it into a contribution from the immediate reward and contribution of future rewards summarized in the Q value at the next state. So specifically the Q value for state as an action A is the expectation, so the sum weighted by probability, so the weighted sum probability of state S prime given when state S took action A of the reward we got on the immediate transition plus gamma, our discount factor, which makes things in the future less valuable than things now, times what we'll get from state S prime onwards. And what will we get from state S prime onwards? Well, how much value do we get there? Well, that's a recursive thing, really. Q star tells us in state S prime, we, if we were to take the optimal action that maximizes this, then we'll get the max over Q star S prime A prime from that next state S prime onwards. Then Q value iteration came down to effectively recursively computing the values in this Bellman equation. 
So we initialize Q0, let's say all zeros, and then from Q0, we can find Q1, from Q1, we can find Q2 and so forth. And we also found that this will converge we run this long enough and we'll have the kind of Q star that we're looking for. Okay, now in tabular Q learning, um, Q value iteration is great. We have to then do these updates, multiple iterations of these updates, and in every iteration, visit every state action and compute an updated value. This assumes access to the transition model and the ability to iterate. Both of these we're going to address, but for now we're going to focus on not requiring access to the transition model. So we can rewrite this as an expectation. Q k plus one is an expected value of instantaneous reward plus future rewards summarized in the Q value at the next state. But once we have an expectation, well, expectations can be approximated by sampling. And that's what we're going to do. So instead of using the exact expectation, which we might not be able to do because in practical situations, we might not have that P S prime given S comma A. That's you know the dynamics of the world. We might not really have that available, but we can experience transitions. We can experience samples. Agent will actually collect those samples. And we can then use those samples to estimate the value on the right-hand side rather than uh, computing it exactly. So for a state action pair SA, we receive a next state S prime coming from the distribution. Then we can consider the old estimate and we can say we have a new target now. If that one sample was fully representative, then this should be the new estimate, our target that we use for the right-hand side, immediate reward plus gamma times value from the next state onwards. Now this is a one sample estimate, so it might not be very precise, but it's an approximation and we'll see that in the algorithms we run, we'll use many samples over time and there will be an averaging effect that will get us closer and closer to a more precise right-hand side. And so we can incorporate this new estimate into a running average. So the QK plus one, the update that we had on the top or on the left side, here was exact. Now we're gonna say, well, it's gonna be an inexact update because if we only have one sample. So we should actually keep around what we had before with some weighting and then mix it with our new target. And what is the effect here? This new target comes from one sample, but by doing this exponentially running average here, every time we get a new sample from state S, we can mix in new targets and we'll get this running average effect that's accumulated into our Q and we'll still get something close to the actual expectation. Okay, so what does the algorithm look like? We start with the Q0 initialization for all states and actions. Then we'll get initial state S that our agent is in, and then we're gonna run this. We sample an action A, agent will act, get the next state S prime. If that's a terminal state, it's the end of an episode, well, then we gotta account for that. Our target is just a reward achieved in transition, and we'll have to reset our agent then else, if it's not a terminal status prime, well, then we have the immediate reward RSAS prime plus gamma our discount factor times the value from the next status prime onward. That's our target based on this one sample. Then we will use this one sample to update our Q value for S comma A by mixing the old Q value with this new target value. And then our agent is next status prime and we'll keep running this. And so as we run this, our agent will keep experiencing state action transitions and rewards, and the Q values will be updated everywhere the agent visits, we'll get these updates. We'll get an averaging effect over time that is similar to running the actual Bellman equation updates with the exact model. Okay, now how do we sample actions? Because in what we just saw in the algorithm here, we have a sampling of actions. How do we choose those actions? Well, you could choose the action that maximizes the Q value in the current state. It's a greedy approach, kind of saying, whatever I think is best, I'm just gonna do. Um, that can work to some extent, that can be okay, but more popular is to not be fully greedy because if you're greedy, if something looks good, you keep doing it, but you have not had a chance to learn about anything else that might be even better. And so epsilon greedy says, randomly choose A action with 
probability epsilon, and then otherwise choose the action greedily, the one that maximizes the Q value. And so, yes, you're often doing the thing that looks best, but you're also mixing in other things. That's exploration. And that's important because by experiencing these other things, if we go back to the algorithm, we'll get updates for other states and actions that we wouldn't get if we just stick to the greedy one. And so we can learn about other things and these other things could be better. So it is important to have this exploration. Okay, so what are some properties of Q-learning? First of all, the amazing result is that Q-learning converges to the optimal policy, even if you're acting suboptimally as you collect your data. It's very, very interesting. It's called off-policy learning. Uh, you know, you're doing this epsilon greedy stuff, you're mixing in suboptimal actions, but these Q updates nevertheless will converge to the optimal Q values and you find the optimal Q values and associate the optimal policy. What are some caveats? Um, you have to explore enough for this to be true. So your exploration mechanism was epsilon greedy or something else has to be present and has to have enough opportunity to explore enough. You have to eventually make the learning rate small enough so it doesn't keep hopping around. So going back to the algorithm, the learning rate here, the alpha, the learning rate, is how much you go towards the new target. You need to decay that over time. Otherwise, the latest experience, the one sample experience will make you hop around too much with every update. And you have to also not decrease it too quickly because otherwise you cannot update enough to make up for new information that might have to you know, correct past information that you incorporated early on. So technical requirements, all states and actions are visited infinitely often. Basically in the limit, doesn't matter how you select actions, but that's just the thing you need to do. Visit every state action infinitely often. And so the learning rate to make that more precise, here's a mathematical condition, the sum of the learning rates that you use over time has to sum to infinity, meaning there's enough power left at any given time. Because if this sums to infinity, that means if you start at any future time past zero, it'll still sum to infinity because what comes before will be finite. So you always have enough juice left effectively in your learning updates to correct for maybe unlucky past experiences that misled you. But then also to make sure the variance is bounded in this whole process, the sum of the squares of the learning rates has to be bounded. And so there are some papers listed below that give the theory behind this. Let's look at some demos. So here's a very simple robot. It's a box with a two link robot arm and it can actuate a motor in here, a shoulder motor and an elbow motor, or maybe think of it as a hip motor and a knee motor. We have a 2D state, two angles. And so it's not too large, but it is continuous. There's a continuum of states. So we're gonna discretize it to be able to run our tabular Q-learning based on samples. And let's see what happens. The reward is for moving off to the right in the forward direction. And actions are, each angle here could go, be increased or decreased. Let's take a look at this. What we see is this robot initially is kind of just, kind of in place, not doing much. And that's the exploration side of things. It's just kind of, Hasn't learned much yet. A lot has to happen before this really kicks into action, starts moving. Our epsilon, by the way, is quite high. It's 0 0.8, so most of the time, random actions are being taken. But it still starts drifting to the right a little bit because sometimes it's a greedy action. It's starting to learn from what the experience collected. Um, keeps collecting data, keep collecting data. And slowly gets better. And now we're gonna change the epsilon and bring it down. What will that do? Well, it means that when it chooses actions, we're now gonna to get to focus on the ones that maximize the Q value rather than being random. Let's see what happens. See, actually now, let's just scoot forward through this. The robot actually is moving forward pretty consistently. So it's actually learned something, even though during the initial training, it was interleaving a lot of random actions and was great for exploration. You wouldn't be able to tell that it was learning. Once you reduce epsilon down to zero, you see it actually learned a lot. It's doing really, really well. Okay, then here is another video of the crawler in action. Um, what are we looking at here? We have the crawler on top, and then here we have on the left values and on the right Q values. So it's a 2D grid, because it's a two-dimensional state space that's discretized. And what would you expect to appear? Right, right now everything's initialized uh, 
zero, so it's red, not high reward. But as it's collecting experience, we expect as it has a positive experience where it gets good reward, that reward will go into the Q value over there. That then will propagate from neighboring states, this is that one, it'll propagate through and we'll see some kind of fanning out of good rewards and it'll figure out what is the right things to do. So what we see here is indeed as it's collecting data, we see the values, there's a region where it's very green, which is good. We see updates happening in various parts of the space. We also see a clear region emerge where it's, it's better than other parts of the space. And so as we go through the learning, and as we went fast forward at many steps here, we see a clear green region where it's really good to be. And once you're there, the agent will move um, very, very fast. And then from the Q values, of course, you can read out the optimal action. So now the question is, can tabular method scale? Let's think about discrete environments. Grid world, 10 states. We can definitely represent a table over 10 states. It's easy enough to do. But Tetris, if you do the count here, there is 10 to the 60 states. We cannot store tables of that size and work with them. Atari, number of states is even higher, 10 to the 100, 300, or even 10,000 plus if working from pixels. So these are very large state spaces, and we don't want to store tables of this size. We need to do something else. Continuous environments, even with crude discretization, the crawler had 100 states, but then a hopper would have 10 to the 10, which is already very large as 10 billion states. Humanoid would have 10 to the 100. So it's not really practical to work with tables with one entry for each of those. We need to do something else. What can we do? What can we do instead of storing a tabular entry for each state? Well, in approximate Q learning, what we'll do is we'll, instead of a table, have a parameterized Q function. It used to be represented in what we talked about so far as a table with entries for each state and action. Now it'll be a function. So Q will be a function that takes in a state S and an action A and will output a value, the Q value for that state S and action A. Now, we don't want to hard code the function. We want to have it learn the right function. So there's a parameter vector theta. And by changing the parameter vector theta, it'll represent a different Q function and have different values for different states and actions depending on the choice of theta. What are some ways of parameterizing the Q function? Well, it could be a linear function in features. Traditionally, this was very popular. These days, you know, not so more popular, but traditionally people would say, hey, let my Q function be a weighted sum of features. And maybe a feature could be something like, I don't know, in Tetris, it could be, how tall is my tallest column? Or, you know, how many gaps are there in the game board so far and so forth? But these days, what's popular typically is using a neural net. And so the neural network has many weights. Theta is the parameter vector of the neural network. You can put in as input state and action outcomes a Q value. Remember, when we do Q learning, we have a target value, reward at the current time plus gamma times expected future rewards that we can look up in the Q function now. And so when we want to compute that target value, we could now go look at that neural network and see what it says is the action that has the highest Q value. And then now with the neural network, we can't just like say, okay, now make this state and action have this value because it's not explicitly keeping entries for each state and action. What we can do is we can say, hey, our neural network representing Q theta needs to nudge the value that outputs for S and A closer to this new target that comes from our sample. And so we'll have this loss function here that says Q theta S A needs to be close to its target based on the recent transition into S prime and then we, let's say, do gradient-based optimization on this to bring the parameter vector theta closer, well, bring the theta, parameter vector theta in a spot where this difference here becomes smaller. Okay, so clearly we're gonna be working with neural nets. So let me do a quick recap of neural nets as a refresher. Neural nets are these networks where you have inputs, they get passed on from layer to layer to layer as they're being processed. Each layer here has multiple units. So you have some numbers going in, then this is one unit. It takes a weighted sum of the inputs, then squishes it through a nonlinearity, passes on to the next layer, and this repeats, 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 and output, let's say, a Q value, for example. If the inputs here, 
or something about state and action, then it might output uh, the Q value for that state and action. Where they've been very popular, of course, is image recognition. It's one example and the you know, canonical, well, the place where really neural nets came of age, the modern era of neural nets is in the ImageNet competition where it was shown that with traditional computer vision, 2010, 30% error rate, 2011, not much better, 2012, not much better. That was traditional computer vision without neural nets. Then Jeff Hinton and his students came in with a neural net approach, AlexNet, that did way better. And then people switched to the deep learning approach all across and a lot of progress was made. Uh, and this is still the dominant method today for computer vision and essentially all other machine learning domains. So this multi-layer perceptron type setup, let's look at it in a little more detail what's in it. There's a linear function that it starts with typically. So a single unit will say my f of x is a matrix w, a weighting matrix times the previous layer x. Then a multi-layer perceptron will stack these linear functions and non-linearities in between. So a two-layer network will look something like my output for an input x is equal to first, I do a matrix multiply with my input x. Then it is non-linearity where for each entry in this resulting vector, if they are below zero, I set them equal to zero. If they're above zero, they stay the same. Multiply it with another matrix. The three-layer network repeats this uh, yet one more time. And it doesn't have to be this max non-linearity. There's others, though the max one is pretty popular. Could be a sigmoid non-linearity, a leaky ReLU, tanage. Uh, ReLU is the one that's the max one we've been seeing on the previous slide. So many variations. Um, the ReLU, Tanish, Sigmoid, Leaky ReLU are probably the four most popular ones uh, these days. And then you can build a multi-layer network that way. And again, keep in mind what we're gonna be doing here in this lecture, this network is gonna represent a Q function, but I'm presenting it in a more general way because these neural networks are used for representing many other things. And in fact, in future lectures, we'll see how they might represent a value function rather than a Q function, or they might represent a policy, or they might even represent a learn dynamics model for the world the agent is acting in. Yeah. So in this case, classifications of what's in an image with convolutional neural networks applied to um, images, let's say. Okay, how do you optimize these neural networks? How do you find the right parameter settings? It's actually a non-convex problem, which for many years people were um, actually scared of and was one of the reasons a lot of people stayed away from neural networks for a long time because it's non-convex. And so what if you get stuck in the local optimum? What can you really guarantee? But gradient-based methods actually are surprisingly effective. And mini-batch stochastic gradients instead of full gradient uh, is often used to speed things up. Gradient calculations, is where do we get the gradient? Well, there's auto diff frameworks like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Chainer, and so forth. Most common methods these days are SGD, stochastic gradient descent, plus momentum, plus some preconditioning in the form of RMS prop or Atom, or Atomax. All these things are things that actually, if you were to implement this, likely you know, you'd know you work with TensorFlow or PyTorch these days and you would have it all available to you. You wouldn't have to implement the details of SGD momentum or back propagation. It's all taken care of for you. You just choose the structure of your neural net and then you feed some data and it then optimizes for you, finding the parameters of the neural net that fit your data best. Okay, if you wanna learn more about this, here are a couple pointers where you can go learn a lot about neural nets in general. What we wanna do here is see how they fit into reinforcement learning, and specifically deep Q networks, where actually in 2013, the, the first big breakthrough happened for deep reinforcement learning. So let's now go back to approximate Q learning. Instead of a table, we have a parameterized Q function, Q theta, often these days a neural network. And what's the learning rule? Well, remember, we're going to get samples, and each sample will generate a target. So by transitioning to state S prime, the agent generates a target because it wasn't state S, took action A, landed in state S prime, there's reward associated with this. And then there's the future reward summarized by the Q function in the next state and taking the best action in the next state. In tabular Q learning, this target can be what we mix with the current value we have for that state and action SA, and that way gradually we, we're doing the right averaging. When we're doing approximate Q learning with a neural network, we cannot just do that kind of averaging, we need to update theta. And so how are we gonna update theta? Well, Q theta is the function we're learning and we have a target and we're gonna say, well, we need to get close to that target. And 
So we have an objective here, a squared loss objective in this case. And we could say, let's drive the error of this to zero by optimizing this objective. That might be a little overfitting because that's just really focusing on the last, very last experience. So more likely you take this objective, you do a few gradient updates, and then you bring in a new experience and do a few gradient updates on the new objective that comes from that new experience and keep repeating. What does it look like in a full reinforced learning algorithm that people might use? So this is the DQN algorithm directly taken from the paper, the DeepMind paper on a learning to play Atari game. So let's step through this in detail. Deep Q learning with experience replay. So there's some extra things here. You initialize the replay memory. So it's a replay memory. So remember on this slide, I said we have an experience from the agent SAS prime. We're going to use it as a target to update our Q function. Instead of just using it once, there's going to be a replay memory D where we're going to store past experiences. And then we can use those experiences multiple times in our Q function learning updates. Then we initialize the Q function with some random weights theta. Then we initialize the target action value Q hat with some other weights. So just two Q functions here. It turns out that by keeping track of two Q functions, effectively we're learning the same thing, but a little bit out of, out of phase, we'll stabilize the learning. And a bit more about that in, in a moment. So we'll have two Q functions that we're tracking here. Initialize our sequence, S1 equal X1 and pre-process process sequence phi1. So there's some notation from the paper here, but essentially what they're saying is, as our agent is acting in the, in the Atari game, it's getting observations. It's actually getting a sequence of frames as observations. And that sequence of frames is pre-processed into a stacked frame phi1 for time one. And so everything that will be worked will be these phi's, which are the stacked frames uh, the agent is working with, because a single frame doesn't always have enough information because there's velocities involved as you move in this world. So we, we're going to be working with these stacked frames, phi. With probability epsilon, select the random action. That's our epsilon greedy action selection me mechanism that we already talked about. Otherwise, we select an action occurring to our Q function. So we looked at this current situation encoded by phi. We look at all actions we have available. So there's a bunch of joystick actions available. We see which one generates the higher Q value and take that action if we're not doing the epsilon thing. Execute the resulting action in the Atari emulator and observe a reward associated with that. The score might go up, which would give us reward and observe the new image. Then we do some processing on the image to again, generate those stacked frames to also understand velocities. And we store the transition from effectively state phi t, action a t, reward r t, and next state phi t plus one into the replay buffer. That's an experience that we can use to generate a target, right? Then we sample a random mini batch of transitions. So we had just a new experience. We don't just use that new experience. We sample a bunch of past experiences. And then for each of these past experiences, state action reward state, we're going to compute a target value. If it's a final termination state, it's just a reward experience. If it's not a termination state, then it's going to be the reward experience plus discount factor times the value at the next state. And we use the Q hat here. So this is interesting because there's two Q functions at play, two neural nets being trained effectively. Q hat is the one we use for the target Q values. But other than there being two, this is exactly what we've been talking about. And then we perform a gradient step to bring the Q function that we're learning, Q theta, closer to the target values, which are called Ys here. And then we repeat. And then periodically, we set our Q hat equal to the Q that we're learning. So this Q hat is something that's lagging behind. It's lagging behind on the Q that we're learning and choosing actions with. And the reason that's done is to stabilize. Because if the Q that we use for generating targets changes too much, it's easy to introduce instabilities. So we want our targets to come from this stabilized lag Q function. So this is the DQN algorithm. There's one more detail that they use to make sure you don't overfit to specific target values. They use a Huber loss instead of a squared loss. So a squared loss, when you're away from zero, grows like it's a parabola, a squared loss. A Huber loss is a parabola at the center, but then at some point becomes linear. And what that means is that any single example 
any single target can only contribute so much to how you're going to update the weights of your neural network. And so you have more averaging happening rather than outliers potentially dominating your updates. And then there's some annealing of the exploration rate. Initially, there's a lot of exploration and epsilon goes closer to zero as we go along. And they don't use just a standard gradient update, but they use RMS prop, which is uh, essentially a rescaling of the gradient updates that is you know, generally found to, to work better than just gradient updates in this case. If you do that, actually the results they showed is it can do really well on a range of Atari games. It learned the neural network takes in pixels and knows the Q values for all actions in that situation. And that allows you then to select the optimal action. They used a 3 million parameter network, some hyperparameters related to Huber laws and learning rates and epsilon greedy, but roughly achieves human level performance on 29 out of 49 games with the approach we just described. Under the hood, the neural net itself had a convolutional architecture, much like the ones used in computer vision at the time that won ImageNet competitions. And the results here on the horizontal axis is a listing of all the games. The vertical axis is performance scaled by human level performance. 100% means human level performance. And we see that about two thirds of the games, the ones on the left here, have human level or better than human level performance. This was back in 2015, the nature version of the DQN paper came out at that time. Uh, since then, there's been improvements on this, but this is the, the big breakthrough result at the time. So what are some improvements on top that have happened? Double DQN says, well, when we take the max of our actions in our target calculation, well, there might be some kind of upward bias. Our Q functions become overestimates because if randomly some action was initialized to have a high Q value, it will be favored in this max. How do we counterbalance that? Well, you're actually going to use, since we have two Q networks already anyway, we're going to use one of them to see which action achieves the max and then use the other one to see what value it has for that action. And so that way, there is some independence between how the action is chosen and the effect of the random. So the randomness might not carry over between the two. And this helps a lot in terms of stabilizing learning and learning actually a lot faster. And all DQN implementations that I know of today are all double DQN implementations actually using this idea to split the argmax, take the argmax from one Q function, and then the max gets taken using that action from the other Q function. Another idea that's often used is prioritized experience replay. Well, you have this buffer of past experiences. Is all this data equally valuable? Maybe some data you can learn more from than other data. And so in prioritized experience replay, you keep track of the Bellman error, how much the target value for a state action reward state quadruple, how much the target value is different from what the Q function currently thinks. And so if the target value is very different from what the Q function would have predicted, then there's a lot to be learned here. And so you get a higher priority. Uh, uniform DQN in gray is the bottom learning curve in both cases, and we see the different versions of experience replay that is prioritized based on Bellman error actually does better. There are more things people have done, something called dueling architectures, distributional DQN, where you don't just try to have the Q function learn the expected rewards, but actually learn a distribution over rewards you might experience in the future. And then there's a noisy version of DQN, which is another way to introduce randomness in the actions you choose to have better exploration. And actually there's a paper called Rainbow DQN, which combines all of these and achieves still today some of the best performance on Atari. For Atari, Rainbow DQN is the natural uh, starting point for anything you would do.